While London Vegas is typically known for its numerous quests, open world, and complex characters that feel real. But one of the things that I also love about the game is how many weapons there really are. Nail guns, Gatling lasers, and even a giant sledgehammer. Oh, baby. But in that variety comes weapons that aren't as good for what you have to do to get them. Believe Me Dry is a quest given to the Thorn by Red Lucy. This quest is often challenging due to the eggs that she wants you to find not being in the grocery store, but instead at several menacing creatures' nests, most notably Cazadors and Deathclaws. No, 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 no. At the end of Bleed Me Dry, you get Dinnerbell, a unique variant of the hunting shotgun. Dinnerbell has the advantage of greater damage compared to a fully modified hunting shotgun, but it's less accurate and holds fewer rounds, making it a mediocre reward for what I consider to be one of the most difficult quests in the game. But what if we only use Dinnerbell? Can we ring our way to the top? Can you beat Fallout New Vegas only using a dinner bell? This suggestion was brought to you from Discord by Decker. If you'd like to give some suggestions or hang out with some really cool people, consider joining with the link in the description. Normally I try to stay away from weapon restricted runs because I find them to be a little bit boring, but this one's a little bit special. We'll have to somehow complete Bleed Me Dry as a pacifist before the rest of the game begins. Before you comment something like, This run is stupid because you can just beat the whole game as a pacifist. Listen up. You're right. Without further ado, let's get a little bit horny and tell some stories. Starting off strong, I find out that my brain has more bullets in it than usual before giving myself the most suitable name for this run. We won't be playing as a twink for this run, so we'll have to make the most beautiful woman and place her on the pedestal of refinement known only to the dinner bell. Getting out of bed, I take a look at my special stats. I end up with a luck build with a decent amount of endurance and intelligence before selecting guns, repair, and survival for my tag skills. Given that we will only have one gun for this run, it's going to be important to keep it in the best condition possible. Logan's loophole and skill were selected before turning on hardcore mode and checking on our difficulty. No, this doesn't make me cool, but it does make me more wrecked than Mia Khalifa's building. For this run, I actually decided to dump everything from our inventory just to spice things up a little bit. After all, we can't use any of our guns, and selling things might make this a little bit too easy. Years later. Stepping out the door, I head to the schoolhouse and start hacking the terminal to unlock the safe. If I haven't mentioned it before, I hate hacking, and I am seriously considering installing a mod to make that easier. My brain no work good on puzzles. This allows me access to a stealth boy in the safe here. Joe Cobb also carries another one, but given that we can't use a varmint rifle, that's kind of off the table. On the road again for the first time in about a week, I get the opportunity to fall in love with this game all over again. I mean, look at those sexy pixels. I make the executive decision to haul my bussy through Hidden Valley, run past the centaurs, say hello to Neil, and ultimately get through Black Mountain itself. Starting right along, I go to the red caravan and grab the combat armor here. This will prove to be a run saver later on. Rather than going straight in the strip, I hug the wall of Camp McCarran and make my way to the thorn. Red Lucy is incredibly hot, so you know we're going to have to pull out the strap on to tap that. She gives me the quest that is essential for this run, and I whip into Freeside. In hindsight, there are a lot of ways you could speedrun doing this if you were smart, but I decided to take the time to get a bunch of levels to at least make my life a little bit easier when doing this quest. There are several quests in Fallout New Vegas that you can do without killing anyone, and working for the king is one of them. Unfortunately, this time around we can't plant an explosive in Oris's pants and have to sit, or rather walk, through the whole process of realizing he's a fraud before climbing back to say hey to the king. Because we've done this quest several times here on the channel, and nothing crazy happens, let's pump it into high gear for a bit. I talk with Roy and Wayne before returning to the king, talking with Julie Farkas, stealing a key, talking with the ringleader of a drug trafficking system that transports through food and the homeless, returning to the king, talking to that lady again to shut down her business, and leveling up three times. I put points mainly into survival, repair, and speech, and grab one of the holy grails of this run, Radchild. Love it or hate it, it does help combat the slow healing that Hardcore Moe's presents, while only decreasing a few of your special stats. Besides, it's not permanent, so if you need to make a check, it's not that big of a deal to get rid of the rads. I walk across the Mojave for some time, admiring the landscape of dust and debris, before finally getting to Boulder City and selling a few goods in exchange for some healing supplies. Because I grabbed Old World Gourmet, alcohol does heal a decent amount, so I'm sure to pick up some of that as well. Talking with a man I've seen leaving my mistress's abode, I learned that there's a situation in Boulder City that can be solved with a simple speech check. Doing just that, I'm rewarded with a bunch of experience, two levels, an increase in guns, and the shotgun surgeon perk. While useless at this moment, it'll be pretty handy later on. Heading over to Camp McCarran, I illegally board the monorail and head to Vegas, where I drink a bunch of water and mentally prepare myself for the first task of collecting the mantis eggs. I've gotten pretty comfortable in Vault 22 as of late, but it wasn't always this way unfortunately. I can remember spending hours down there in this rusty maze. 
It really isn't that complicated once you've gotten rid of all your friends and dedicated a YouTube channel to Fallout New Vegas, but if I was you, I'd just repair the elevator and use the stealth boy to sneak through all the plant life. It isn't as smooth as that as I do die a couple times here due to the stealth boy not quite being strong enough to stand right next to the mantis, but eventually I'm able to grab the eggs and turn in the first part of the quest to Red Lucy. The next part of my plan is rather unorthodox. See, the only way to do this quest at such a low level without being able to kill anything is by using speed, stealth, and your sphincters to clench your butt when all else fails. I knew that I was going to need more stealth boys, so like a nightkin on the hunt for their next fix, I set off from the wasteland and found myself in Cottonwood Cove. There are a few ways of getting liked by the Legion without doing any quests for them, most notably turning in NCR dog tags and teaching them how to disarm landmines. Because we don't have enough explosive skills for the latter, we'll have to stick with the former. Back at the strip, I speak with the cute fun boy cowboy before drinking some water and stealing a bunch of NCR dog tags. By returning to someone named after a bird, couldn't be me to be honest, we can turn in all of our tags, hop aboard the boat to the fort, walk a mile for dramatic effect, talk with the lunch lady, and get the key to the Legion safe house we discovered earlier. Hopefully you are still with me after all that because in this next section, I'm going to essentially shove a 12 inch dildo up my rear before using it as a Christmas tree chopper. I love tops. Now that I've got your attention, in order to leave the fort, you need to destroy or enable the Securitrons in the bunker below. Normally this task is pretty easy, on very hard during a pacifist run, often goes a little bit worse. But since I picked up the combat armor earlier, a crap ton of healing supplies, and Radchild, I was essentially able to tank all the damage and get to the console to insert the chip. While we aren't siding with house this run, this is the only way I can think of of passing this area, as we don't have or can use weapons to destroy the generators. Returning to the Kaiser, I level up, allowing me guns, repair, and the handloader perk. At the Legion safe house, I meet the saving grace of this run. While there are other places you can get stealth boys at, Atticus is the only consistent place that I know of. Using a stealth boy allows me to grab the eggs just outside of Good Springs, but when I got a little bit too close, I was spotted. Remember earlier how I had mentioned puckering of the butts should things go a little bit sideways? That's what saved me here. I puckered my butt like I do every time I'm about to get pegged in the anticipation of pleasure. I puckered my butt like I do every time I go poop because I'm still worried about alligators or crocodiles coming up and eating my petite balls. I pucker my butt like I do every time a man thinks about prostate cancer as if he's checking that it's still there. All of that puckering allows me to escape with my life and return to my future lover. She gives me yet another task of grabbing fire gecko eggs. While I take off from Novak and start heading towards the unmarked Poot Jack Cavern, I'd like to ask for your support. If you like my videos, please consider checking out my Patreon. You can get early access to thumbnails, a fancy role on the Discord server, and even see behind the scenes from editing. After that shameless self-plug and a lot of walking, let's step inside this spooky cave. This one is actually probably the easiest one so far, as I was almost only detected once, and I didn't really have any other close calls. Walking away with the eggs, I eventually get to fast travel back to the Thorn and grab the next quest, Night Stalkers. So you may be thinking that I just head to the cave and use a stealth boy again, but you'd be wrong. Owl likes to keep things a little bit interesting, so at the back of his mind, when he first selected his special stats, you may have noticed that I didn't use Charisma as a dump stat like I normally do. Charisma, in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, is basically useless. Outside of a few rare interactions with kids that don't involve assault, and a couple of other checks, it's really pointless. But at level 10, 6 Charisma, and 45 Survival, you have the opportunity to get the perk Animal Print. While this perk is also useless, as you can usually kill everything with ease, this is a pacifist playthrough until I get Dinner Bell. So instead of using a stealth boy like I should have done, I painstakingly tried to remember all the quests that don't involve violence. Fan graphs offer a few quests that you can do until you have to track down Cass, the NCR Correctional Facility and the Powder Gangers have a couple of walking simulator quests, and the entire Lucky Old Sun quest can be completed without hurting a single robot or person as long as you survive the bots inside. Surprisingly enough, the whole Boomer's quest line can be beaten without killing anything. We've all probably seen these quests done about a dozen or so times, so let's grab the animal friend perk and get back to business. I'm gonna let the footage speak for itself here, and instead tell you about that time that I abandoned what could have been true love. I met her on a hot summer day at the beach. She was standing alone, looking out at the water, and I couldn't help but notice her. She was beautiful, with long brown hair that flowed in the breeze, and dark brown eyes that seemed to sparkle in the sunlight. The sunlight was the last thing I had seen before I was smacked in the face with an inflatable beach ball. I hadn't been to the beach before, and a few of my friends from high school had invited me out to play a bit of volleyball and have a few drinks. 
I was there for the volleyball and not the drinks of the ocean, which I still didn't like it at the time. But it turns out that I had found something, or someone else, entirely. Bidding the sand out of my mouth from the ball, I approached her hesitantly, not wanting to intrude. Something about her pulled me in. I dropped my sunglasses a few feet in front of her and crouched down to pick them up and say hello. We struck up a conversation about sandcastles of all things, and I was immediately drawn to her. She was intelligent, witty, and had a great sense of humor. We talked for hours, and before I knew it, the sun was beginning to set. I asked if she'd like to go for a walk along the shore, and she agreed. As we walked, the conversation flowed easily between us. We talked about everything and anything, and it felt like we had known each other for years. I couldn't believe how comfortable I felt with her, and I knew that I was falling for her. But as the nights wore on, I realized that there was one problem. I was leaving for a new job in a week, and we would almost be four hours apart. My heart sank in as I realized we were going to have to say goodbye. We parted ways that night, both of us knowing that we were leaving something special behind. I went off to the job, and she stayed behind, both of us trying to move on with our lives. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get her out of my head. I thought about her all the time, wondering what she was doing and if she was thinking about me. And then, one day... I received a letter from her. It was a long letter, filled with all the things that she wanted to tell me but hadn't had the chance to say in person. She told me about her life, about the things that she was doing and the places that she was going. She told me that she missed me and that she was sorry we had to be apart. It broke my heart, knowing that someone took the time to write me a letter, and that my life choices prevented me from getting to know her more. I had written several letters growing up, and even then they were considered going out of style. It's a shame. Letters are beautiful. As Red Lucy laid her on her bed, and I left to start my own journey, I left a letter on her nightstand, confessing my love for her and for the thorn. I'd never see either one of them again, but I knew that they would be okay without me. Trading with Venertron, I headed the strip, where I could finally start the quest for the NCR, which is who I chose to side with for this run. I just got done with the Legatlanius run, and I really don't ever feel like watching that 5 minute cutscene in the Lucky 38 again, if I can help it. Ambassador Crocker sends us to the Boomers to get their assistance. Boom. Done. Ambassador Crocker sends us to get the Kings to be more accepting of the NCR. Boom. Done. While I murder the Great Cons because at this point I really want to put the shotgun to use, I'm going to tell you a fable I wrote about determination. There once was a little bird named Tweety who lived in a small nest in the forest. Tweety was determined to learn how to fly, even though all the other birds told him that he was too small and weak to soar through the sky. Every day, Tweety would stretch his wings and practice flapping as hard as he could. He knew it wouldn't be easy, but he never gave up. One day, a strong gust of wind blew through the forest, and Tweety saw it as his chance. He spread his wings off and tried to fly, but he couldn't seem to get lift. He tried and he tried, but he just couldn't get off the ground. The other birds laughed and told Tweety to give up, that he would never be able to fly. But Tweety refused to listen. He kept practicing day after day, until finally, one day, he felt a surge of strength and determination. He flapped his wings with all of his might, and to everyone's surprise, he took off into the sky. The other birds were shocked and amazed. They had never seen anything like it. Tweety flew higher and higher, soaring through the clouds and feeling the wind beneath his wings. As he flew, Tweety realized that he had proved everyone wrong. He had never given up, even when the odds were against him. And that determination had paid off. Moore told me the same thing when I returned to her after taking care of the great cons, so that filled me up with enough mommy dami energy to be willing to solve all of her problems for her, including killing the Amertas. I literally just wanted to continue murdering people, so that's what I did. In hindsight, I wish I would have bought some chems first, but everyone has regrets. I spent a whole lot of time just hiding behind counters and playing the game with one hand, because I was busy relieving some tension with the other hand. I get these awful headaches sometimes when I haven't drank enough water, so I usually drink about a gallon a day. On the bright side, the acne that I used to have in middle school is long gone. When I returned to mommy and told her the same thing about the Amertas, she was a little bit upset with me, so she locked me in a chastity cage and sent me off to deal with Mr. House. The fact that Mr. House and chastity were mentioned in the same sentence not only worries me, but also confirms that Mr. House is a femboy switch with the cutest thigh highs that the world has ever seen. Long live Mr. House. After eliminating the world's richest crossdresser, I take on the folks that are a little bit incestual. You see, the Brotherhood of Steel really love each other. I feel the same way about my friends. When I was in middle school, I would often go to the park on the weekends with a few of my classmates. This particular day was great. 
I enjoyed the warm weather and a fun game of catch. We were all laughing and having a good time when suddenly something terrible happened. I wasn't paying attention to where I was throwing the ball. It flew out of my hand and hit my friend square in her face. I could tell from the look of pain on her face that I had really hurt her. I felt terrible and I immediately apologized. I helped her to her feet and asked if she was okay. She was crying and holding her face. I could see that it was already starting to swell. I knew that I had to do something to make it right. I offered to take her to the hospital, but she said that she just wanted to go home. So I called her parents and explained what had happened. They were upset, but understanding. They told me to bring her home and that they would take care of the rest. I felt terrible the whole way home. I couldn't believe that I had accidentally hurt my friends, and I was determined to make it up to her. When we arrived at her house, I apologized again and offered to do whatever she needed to make things right. To my surprise, she was understanding. She told me that accidents happen and that she knew that I didn't mean to hurt her. She said that she forgave me and that we could still be friends. I wish that that would have remained true, but we stopped hanging out after that unfortunately. Almost the exact same thing happened when I talked to the guard for the president's vertebrate, and I was upset that I had lost yet another friend. Fortunately, in the darkness, there was a light. With the animal friend perk, you can adopt Ranger Steven's dog, so I pretended that I was shooting a car commercial for a bit before taking care of the sniper and killing the guy with the detonator. All was well, but it wouldn't be Fallout in Vegas without the NCR suddenly shooting me and causing me to have to redo the whole thing. I really need to stop playing this game like it's a speedrun. After recovering from that whole fiasco and grabbing rapid reload, I returned to Black Mountain to kill a boatload of supermoons. Could you imagine a Fallout game in the ocean? Stopping at different islands, diving deep in the water with O2 tanks, waterproof power armor, ships made out of scrap, raiders and pirates blocking your path, and even crazy mutated sea creatures. I don't think anything like that would ever happen, but it'd be super cool, and that's speaking from someone who is absolutely scared of the ocean. After yesifying Rhonda and releasing Rawl from his handcuffs that he lost the key to, I had to search light to play a little bit of Walking Dead. Dinner Bell itself is a decent shotgun, but I really don't like it myself due to the low fire rates and the long reload times. With most long guns, that is part of the whole idea, but the reload time is usually permitted with the long distance between you and your target. In this case, I spend more time behind cover than actually in combat, so it makes it a little bit lackluster. I do find myself using VATS a little bit more here, but it still continues to bug out extensively. Wanting to level up some more, I take on Nelson and put the Legion there out of their misery. I also stocked up on supplies at the medical center and grabbed the subdermal implant for a little bit more resistance to damage. I put that to the test at Ultra Lux because I absolutely hate them and how often their stupid quest breaks. I'll be honest here, I went on a little bit of a rampage here with the shotgun. It did grow on me a little bit, but the previous statement still stands. That said, it was more than able to take out a bunch of Legion and Fiends. I'm pretty bad at voicing over a bunch of people dying, so here's the story about the time that I almost died. It was a beautiful day for a hike. The sun was shining and the birds were singing. My dog and I were experienced hikers, so I wasn't as worried about the wet stones as what I should have been. I packed the lunch for myself and brought plenty of water for the dog and I. I was excited to take in the sights, enjoy the fresh air, and get out of the hospital for a bit. As we hiked, I took pictures with my camera that I got for Christmas one year, taking in the stunning views of the surrounding landscape. The trail was a bit rocky and uneven in places, but that was to be expected. At one point, we came to a narrow path that wound along the side of the mountain. The drop off to the trail was steep, and the trail itself was slippery. The dog and I moved slowly and carefully, testing our footing before each step. As we made our way along the path, I felt a sudden jolt as my foot slipped on a loose rock. I lost my balance and I tumbled to the ground, sliding down the slope towards the edge of the drop off. I screamed as I clutched the rocks and dirt, trying to stop my fall. The only thing that saved me was her. When I hike with my dog, we are like a tandem bike. She is always at my hip and I have a second belt that a leash and harness fit through. Without getting into describing the materials or colors, this thing is durable and the only thing that would separate us is me unclipping the latch on her harness. As my dog pulled up the hill and fought under the strain of me and the pack on my back, I grabbed onto a nearby root and took note of the damage. I had suffered a serious injury to my right leg, with multiple lacerations running down my leg with most of the damage being superficial to the patella. Blood began running down my sock before I was able to pull myself up with the help of the dog. I paused for a moment reflecting on what happened, picture what could have happened. On the roughly 4 miles back, I limped, feeling the pain in my hip. I still feel it pop to this day. But through perseverance and a lot of bullets, I was able to prove that you could beat Fallout in Vegas only using Dinner Bell. I had a blast for this challenge. While weapon restricted runs really aren't my favorite, the dinner bell with the right build can kill virtually anything. 
If you like this video, consider checking out me playing the full game of Control. In it, we use even more sexual innuendos and have some more story time while solving puzzles and using superpowers. And hey, you have a good one.